Caleb have already noted this is chapter 9 in your books. We're going to talk about spatial energy. We already talked a little bit about photopic and scotopic vision, right? We talked about this is when you have a lot of light, this is when you don't have much light. For scotopic vision, we're thinking about rods. All right, You've got a number of those, right? Uh, light level, again, is going to be very low. <clears throat> color is going to be monochromatic. We just talked about color vision. You got your peak spectral sensitivity, nothing to worry about there. What we want to think about, though, is spatial and temporal sensitivity. Right? This is going to be very confusing to probably all of you. Probably 125% of you are going to be confused. It's because I think a couple of you are going to be even more confused than is possible. All right, Marissa, so that's, be ready for this. Just hang on. Photopic vision, we're thinking cones. Again, you've got to have a lot of light. They are trichromatic. And they have a different set of spatial and temporal sensitivities. Okay. Vision in photopic conditions is going to be cones. We have very high spatial acuity, typically in our cone system. Our cones are located primarily in the fovea. That's kind of in that center point of your, your retina, uh, your optical center point. Okay. This is why when you try to read something important, you, know, you have your, your, your screen, your book, whatever it is, you don't hold it out to the side. right? You don't try to read it in the periphery. You read it with your fovea right in the middle. Okay. Scotopic light or scotopic vision is going to be rods. Very sensitive, but not very good spatial resolution and no color discrimination. Okay. So we need to think about these two different uh, types of vision and uh, and why they're important. All right. When we're thinking about spatial vision, right, we're thinking about what we call spatial contrast <coughs> sensitivity. And that's a lot right in that sort of title, right? So what do we mean by this? When we're thinking about spatial, what do we, what do we mean by spatial? What we mean is moving across points in your visual field, right? That's spatial. Where are things located? When we talk about contrast, we're talking about, remember, contrast is, is the difference between the highest and lowest luminance values in a particular scene, right, Abby? So, so that's contrast. And sensitivity, we're, we're just really asking, like, how good are you at this, right? So what we want to know is, given a certain amount of objects in your visual space, how good are you at determining that they're independent objects at different contrast values? Okay? Or we can sort of ask the reverse question. Given a certain contrast, how many objects can you clearly resolve or can you clearly determine our separate objects in your visual space? They're really sort of inverted questions, right? To do this, to study this, we really want to use a very uh, controllable stimulus. And in this case, we're going to use something called a luminance 
Brady. Okay. This is going to be important that you understand luminance gradings. We're going to walk you through this. Okay. Hang in there. I promise. So again, we're going to see how good are you at detecting spatial detail. We're going to use these luminance gradings. There are four parameters for gradings. We're going to, I'm going to show you what all those are. But it's frequency, contrast, orientation, and phase. Okay. And what we want to know is what we're really trying to figure out is what is the minimum amount of contrast required to detect a gradient. Okay? So at different frequencies, and we're going to be doing things at different frequencies, how much contrast do I need to be able to see that gradient? This is a luminance gradient. Okay? It looks exciting, right? Why do we call it a gradient? So if you look at, you know, like a grate, right? It's kind of have bars, right? So we have dark bars, we have light bars, and they alternate. Dark light, dark light, dark light across this. We are going to assume that this circle represents one visual degree. Okay? One visual degree. One angle. So if you look into the world and if you think about like the space around you is 360 degrees, right? And you're you can see like 178 of that. And then so if you divide that into this is going to be one one degree diameter, okay? That's what we're seeing. If we look at spatial frequency, that's going to be F, that's going to be frequency. Frequency is measured in what we call cycles per degree, okay? Or CPD, it's sometimes abbreviated, cycles per degree. So, we've already said what is a degree, right? That's just one small bit of the visual world, right? We measure that in degrees. So what is a cycle? Well, in this case, because we're dealing with dark bars and light bars, a cycle is a dark bar and a light bar. It's a pair, right? That's one cycle, okay? So we have a dark bar and we have a light bar. That's a cycle. That's pretty cool, right? So if our spatial frequency is really 16 cycles per degree. How many bars do we have in that one degree? 32, right? Because you have a dark bar and a light bar for every single cycle. Okay? If you have 16 cycles, 16 dark bars, 16 light bars, you have 32 bars. And we can adjust this spatial frequency. If we take it down to four, that's four cycles per degree. Okay? So we have four sets of dark bars and light bars. So we have a total of eight bars. Right? Take it on down to one cycle per degree. That means we have one dark bar and one light bar. Okay? You can even go lower. You could go down to half a cycle per degree. That'd just be one bar. It'd be a dark bar or a light bar, right? go all the way, I mean, go all the way up to whatever, really. But this goes up to 32 on this, this particular uh, display. So, if we were to count this, 
there would be 32 pairs of dark bars and light bars for a total of 64 bars. Does that make sense? Can everybody see that there are separate bars here? Dark bars and light bars. Okay, great. Now, this is our contrast value of 0 0.5. So who remembers that contrast equation where we did the, the minimum and the maximum contrast luminance values and we subtracted and added and then we divide it, right? And we got some number between 0 and 1. So if we go up to, let's go up to 0.99. So if we go all the way up to 1, basically what we mean is the dark bar is as dark as possible and the light bar is as light as possible, right? Now if we, as we move back down toward 0 0.5, for example, the dark bars are not as dark and the light bars are not as light. So instead of being this far apart, we've just gradually brought the contrast closer. There's still a dark bar and there's still a light bar, right? But they're not as different, okay? And if we keep dropping this down, the dark bars and the light bars get closer and closer together until you get to zero contrast and there is no difference between the dark bars and the light bars. Right? Because the, luminum, the, 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 the minimum luminance and the maximum luminance are the same value. Okay? And it doesn't matter what your spatial frequency is. You can't see it. Okay. If you had just a little contrast, then you can start to see that, right? Now what's interesting is looking at the interaction, and we will do this in a moment, at the interaction between contrast and spatial frequency. Okay. So if you look at this, it's quite a bit easier to see higher frequencies at that lower contrast, right? We'll, we'll show you that. All right, so let's add a little contrast back to this. Something that's reasonable to see, about a 0.5. Let's go back to a reasonable sort of spatial frequency there. We can see that fairly easily, right? The two other, I should probably drop down just a the two other characteristics of a luminance grading are orientation and phase. And now orientation is pretty easy. So this is a zero orientation. There's 45, so we're just tilting, right? Go down to 90. Go all the way back around. Well, all the way around. That's 180, right? So you have orientation. So that's pretty cool, right? There's orientation. The other thing we can look at is phase. And for phase, what we would do is we would shift the location. So if you look here, this is sort of the, the top, the peak of a white bar, right? If you can follow where that arrow is. And if I shift the phase, ooh, 180 degrees, I've gone from the peak of a white bar over to the peak of a dark bar, right? 90 degrees is going to put you about in the middle of that transition. If you go all the way to 360, it's going to put you right back to the top of a white bar, right? Because we're moving into another cycle. Okay? How many of you understand these four parameters? Does anybody not understand one of them? Or more than one of them? Check this out, this is cool. This is showing you what we call the contrast sensitivity function, spatial contrast sensitivity function. So if you look at this, spatial frequency increases from left to right. So this is spatial frequency. And here it's low, and here it's high.
contrast increases from top to bottom. <coughs> so this is contrast. It's low at the top, and it goes down to high at the bottom. Okay. And if you look at this, if you pick any sort of contrast, so like here's a random contrast you can pick, and you follow that across, what you will notice is that this is what we call band pass. Okay. So, at low spatial frequencies, we need a higher contrast to be able to see that, right? So up here, you don't see anything at that low contrast, right? You don't really see anything at the low contrast for any of these until you get right you know, below that line, right? And then you can start to see the dark bars and the light bars, okay? But it really sort of, uh, you really can't see the dark and the light bars here. You have to go down a little bit to start seeing the dark and the light bars. So you need more contrast to see low frequencies. Okay. What's also interesting is you start to lose some of the high frequencies at the low contrast as well, right? So Macy, this is what we mean by band pass. So in reality, the medium frequencies are the ones that are easiest to see at the lowest uh, contrast, right? So if you pick this sort of lowest contrast here, what you'll see is nothing in this area and you start to see a little bit here, and then you'll notice it'll start to fade off again as you get to the higher frequencies, right? So we're really great at seeing medium frequencies at low contrast. To see the high frequencies or the low frequencies, we need more contrast in the image, okay? And we could do that back here. We could set up that high contrast image Take this down until the part where we, you know, we thought it kind of, well, that's like the lowest number you can get. And as you notice, like the low frequencies, it's hard to see, gradually becomes easier to see, and then there's just a little bit of a drop off in the higher frequencies. Well, if we were to go higher, it would be even more pronounced. Okay? Who has questions about this? Nobody? Because we're going to add something to this in a moment. So hang in there. All right. Who loves graphs? This graph is basically showing you what we just saw. Now, this contrast threshold thing is sort of confusing. So we'll flip it and we'll just look at this guy. Contrast sensitivity. Here's your spatial frequency, again, in cycles per degree. Now, this is logarithmic. Don't worry about that too much. Okay. What you see is as you go from low spatial frequency to high spatial frequency, you see that at first there is an increase in sensitivity, which means you need less contrast, right, because you're becoming more sensitive. Okay. And then you see a little bit of a plateau. But as you go to the higher frequencies, notice the drop-off in sensitivity, right? So you need more contrast at those higher frequencies. This graph is what we just saw from this image, right? And if we were to test you on this, what we would do is we would show you a random assortment of contrasts and spatial frequencies and see whether or not you could see those, okay? Does this graph make sense to someone? Just to one person, that's all I need, just one person who thinks they understand this. Regan, you seem fairly confident on this. Just a little bit, it's not too bad, right? Basically, it's this, it's this simple. As you increase spatial frequency, you need less contrast. Until you get a point where the 
frequencies get so high, you actually need more contrast. And that's just the structure of your visual system that limits your contrast sensitivity. Does that make sense to everybody? No. Um, I'm going to try to think of another example. So how many of you know that sleeping more helps your grades? Right? It helps you with your memory, right? Okay. That's up until a certain point, right? Uh, so at first, yes, sleeping more will improve your grades. It will make you more sensitive to learning material, right? So you'll be better at that, Taylor. Up until the point you start sleeping in class. And then obviously you're not getting anything, right? And so you have that kind of drop off in performance. It's the same thing with your visual system. Though your visual system is structured, as you start to increase spatial frequency from the lowest spatial frequencies up to that mid range, you need less contrast. You're better at seeing those middle frequencies. Okay? If you keep increasing the frequency though, we need more contrast because we're not as good at seeing that. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, great. Well, check this out. How many of you are excited by this image? All right, great. Now, how many of you remember that time we talked about parvocellular and magnocellular layers? And we talked about midget and parasol ganglion cells. And we talked about receptive field size, right? Okay. This is why you have to have different size receptive fields. So let's take a look at this low spatial frequency here. All right. Now, if you look at this guy, this is where this particular receptive field gets really excited. And then on the surrounding area here, these are actually areas that are inhibiting when they get excited. So this guy, this receptive field, the entire receptive field falls right on a light bar, okay? So we don't get any information about that other than it's a light bar, right? So it gets a little bit excited, gets a little bit inhibited. Not too big of a deal, right? Larger receptive fields, on the other hand, Regan, look, the excitatory part will fall right on a dark bar or a light bar. In this case, it's a light bar. And then the inhibitory flanks will fall on one of the other darker light bars, whatever the case is. In this case, it's dark bars. So this receptive field will be able to tell us, yeah, I'm pretty excited by this because I got a lot of excitation in the middle. And then my inhibitory flanks, well, they were also sort of excited because they got the dark bars, right? And so that's what they were looking for. The middle was looking for a light bar, the flanks were looking for dark bars. We got that, lots of excitation. This receptive field, the middle was looking for a light bar and it got it. The flanks were looking for dark bars, but they got light bars. So they got a little bit inhibited, but they got a little bit excited. So they're kind of like, I don't know, right? Okay, that's kind of the response you get from that. Now, if we move over to higher spatial frequencies, Let's take a look at that large receptive field again. The center is going to be looking for a light bar, but it gets a light bar, but it also gets a couple dark bars. And the flanks are looking for dark bars, which it got, but it also got a couple light bars. So we're getting sort of mixed input there, right? And Marissa, again, we get the, I don't know, kind of response. The smaller receptive field, on the other hand, though, because the center gets excited by a light bar, guess what, that's all it got and the surround got excited by dark bars, that's all that it got, it gets really excited and it says, it's a high spatial frequency, I'm really sensitive to this. So we have different size receptive fields, they're set up in different ways, for different spatial frequencies. Now, what's interesting about this, if you are most sensitive to this range of frequencies, that probably tells you that most of your receptive fields are of a size that fit those frequencies, right? 
If you were really excited by higher frequencies, then all of your receptive fields would be super, super small. If you were excited by really low frequencies, then all your receptive fields would be really, really big, right? But because you're mostly excited by these middle frequencies, most of your receptive fields are going to be in that middle range. Does that make sense? It's pretty cool, right? I thought it was exciting. <coughs> hey, remember that time I said, if flashing lights bother you, get ready because flashing lights are going to come up. All right. We have talked about spatial contrast sensitivity. Right? You guys have a handle on, on space. Now we're going to talk about time. Are you ready for this, Oliver? It's going to be exciting. All right, so how do we measure temporal sensitivity? Well, instead of measuring in cycles per degree, we actually measure in what we call hertz or cycles <coughs> per second. So in this case, what we're interested in is How fast does this flash, right? Okay. How fast does it flash between max luminance and min luminance? Okay. And that's what we're seeing here. So that's what's measured in contrast again, maximum luminance and minimum luminance. Okay. And again, if we were to measure that for this, it would be 0 0.5 in this case. Now, here we have three hertz. There are three cycles per second. So three times it goes dark light, dark light, dark light. That's three. Okay. Again, because it's a cycle, we have to go dark and light, right? So we have to go maximum luminance to minimum luminance, right? So that's one cycle. Okay. But we're not really thinking about changing space, right? So we're not moving across space. We're just changing things in time. Okay. Now we can increase. There's 6 hertz. Let's go all the way up to 13 hertz. 13 times per second, this is going dark light, dark light, dark light. 13 times. Now, if that contrast is 0 0.5, contrast is 1, 0 0.9, what if we make the contrast all the way at the bottom? seeing this flash and you're clearly seeing that it flashes right but can you tell which one is the 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 darker and which is the lighter or do they all look the same to you compared to this Justin you can tell which one's darker and which one's lighter right it's harder to do here if I increase that contrast it's obviously pretty easy okay now we can do the same thing for temporal contrast sensitivity that we did for spatial contrast sensitivity, right? We're still going to have contrast sensitivity on this side. So how good are you at that? But on the bottom, instead of spatial, we're going to have temporal frequency, right? So it's not how many bars can I jam into one degree of space, it's how many times can I flicker that patch of light, okay? And what you see here, and again, we're going to focus on photopic vision. You see a little bit of an increase, a little bit of a plateau there. So right around um, 8 hertz is typically the highest. Okay, so it's kind of like right in this area. Look at that straight line I just drew. Uh, and then we're going to see that drop off at the higher frequencies. And we saw that, right? So if we were to make this the highest frequency possible and we dropped that contrast, that became very difficult for us to tell the difference between the lightest and the darkest. But at the lower frequencies, we were able to do that. And in fact, we're, we're probably better at it at even some of these. That's even kind of hard to do, right? A 0.4 contrast to see which one's darker and which one's lighter. 
you slow it down to begin that eight hertz, that's where we're most sensitive. Questions about this? Well, look at that. Isn't that fun? Uh, so, we've talked about space, Oliver. We've talked about time. Let's talk about space and time together, right? And so we want to talk about spatiotemporal contrast sensitivity. Because, well, this is what we want to do. But again, these medium... So here's what we see. Medium spatial frequencies, that's the middle right of the image that's over here, are less visible when the pattern flickers. So you can kind of okay. So at these high temporal frequencies, what we actually see is that it becomes easier for us to see the lower spatial frequencies than the higher spatial frequencies. So it sort of flips. Remember when we were just talking about spatial frequency, we said these guys here in that middle range were the easiest to see, right? But now, Marissa, that we're flickering it at these higher flicker rates, those lower frequencies are easier to see. These ones in the middle, they, they kind of drop off a little bit. Okay. So, space and time, uh, temporal frequency and spatial uh, frequency interact, right? And they give you a different outcome. Oliver, this graph is just for you. Nobody else. So everybody else can take a break. We're going to talk about the spatio-temporal contrast sensitivity. So basically, this plot okay, shows you, over space and over time, what becomes a dark spot and what becomes a light spot. You can kind of go across space at any given moment in time and see what that is. So that's pretty cool, right? Don't wrap your heads around that too much. Now what's interesting about this is there's this trade-off between spatial acuity and temporal acuity, right? So at low temporal frequencies, so that's low flicker rates, we have that high sensitivity at the medium spatial frequencies. At the higher temporal frequencies, when things are flickering really, really fast, sensitivity is highest at the low spatial frequencies, okay? What this indicates to us is that there are probably two parallel pathways uh, processing this information. That's why we see that weird sort of interaction, right? There was only one pathway processing this information. We would anticipate that when we added that temporal frequency component, it would, we would still be most sensitive to the same range of, of spatial frequencies, right? Yeah, but we didn't see that happen. So, in the low, because Marissa, I got to bring it back to that Magno Parvo story, right? Because I mentioned that. At the low temporal frequencies, mostly it's going to be cells in the Parvo cellular division of the LGN. At the high temporal frequencies, it's mostly ones in the Magno cellular division. Because remember, Parvo cellular was small, right? And so at the low temporal frequencies, we were able to see the smaller bars, right? the higher spatial frequencies. When we got to the high temporal frequencies, it's going to be those larger cells that are going to be active because it's these guys down here on this low end. Okay? Questions about that? Here's a face, in case you didn't know what that was. Danielle, I was just throwing that out there. Some people want to make sure everybody catches up at some point. So there's a face. What's kind of cool about this is um, this middle face has been what we call low pass filtered. So basically only the low spatial frequency information is coming through, right? There's not a lot of high spatial frequency information in that image. 
the image over here has been a high pass filter, so only high spatial frequency information is coming through. See, these are two different images that are using two different pathways, either your magnocellular or your parvocellular. Make sense to everybody? That's pretty cool. So, fine scale details tell us about surface properties and texture. That's pretty cool. The coarse scale details tell us about general structures and shapes. that time we talked about Fourier transforms and we said that all sounds are just series of sound wa sine waves, right? Well, all images can really be uh, broken down into sine waves as well. Okay. And if you see here we have sort of this low frequency sine wave and we're going to add to it a higher frequency sine wave and here's what you get. Look. Okay. Get a new waveform. And then if you add some other waveform to that, then you get another waveform. You can continue to build, right? Until you get uh, you know these other sort of uh, more complicated images, right? Nothing to worry about too much there. Again, it's a Fourier theory. Right? We're just going to use that uh, series of sine wave gratings and we can make any image that we want right? using sine wave gratings, okay? mathematically at least. Again, the high spatial frequencies are going to have fine scale info, whereas the low spatial frequencies have the coarse scale info. We can add these together to make that complex natural image. Okay? When we think about spatial filters, this is just showing you the sensitivity of the magnocellular and the parvocellular divisions. Again, larger receptive fields, it's going to peak at a lower spatial frequency. Higher or uh, smaller receptive fields, it's going to peak at a higher spatial frequency. So we've got those two systems sending information up to your cortex, right? Not a big deal. Don't worry too much about the one down here. Parvo LGN cells, higher spatial frequencies, magno uh, is going to be lower spatial frequencies. Once we get to cortex, we'll more, more narrowly tune the spatial frequencies, right? Not a big deal. And those complex images that you see every day that you're looking at right now, because they contain many different spatial frequencies, they will actually activate receptive field sizes across the full range. Okay? It's not a big deal. There is some psychophysical evidence, so this is not just sort of theoretical thinking about this, right? We can actually give folks these um, like adaptation tests, right? We can adapt them to higher low frequency gratings and that um, you know has some effect, right? This is kind of cool. So if you stare at the gray dot, right? Just keep staring at it and then it'll pause. What's really kind of interesting is that uh, after five seconds, the test grading appears for one second. And that test grading contains an identical frequency in the upper and the lower uh, frequencies. But after you do this a few times, you might notice that they actually look different. The upper section probably looks like it's a uh, higher frequency uh, than the lower section. Okay. So just uh, it does this contrast reversal thing, right? So if you keep staring at it, we'll do this a few times. for 
anybody? No. Just keep staring at it for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. It'll happen. All right. Uh, what is the significance of multiple spatial filters? Because we have multiple spatial filters. Uh, edge location, texture analysis, and then stereo and motion analysis. Now we're going to talk a lot about all of this uh, in, in future chapters in future weeks. Okay. This is kind of cool, though. Um, basically, you can actually lo locate edges better than the distance between photoreceptors, right? Um, and that's because you have some sort of overlapping effects here of photoreceptors, right? So if you take a look at this, and you look at the way these, um, you know, these changes sort of shift, right, in this photoreceptor array, even though the peak is not that far apart, you can see who gets more excited. Again, we're looking at, guess what's important here? Conex citation ratios, right? Because we can use these conex citation ratios to determine if this stimulus has shifted one direction or the other. Okay. Don't worry too much about this. We're going to talk about this as we go forward. But this is sort of this like filter rectify filter process that we'll talk about in the next uh, chapters. We talk about shape and object recognition, okay? But you have to have spatial vision and understand spatial vision to be able to, to grasp that. And again, we'll talk about stereo motion analysis later. All right, who has questions about spatial vision? <laughs>